531, let's get cracking. Hi everyone, so glad you could join us here for the last day of March. Um, welcome to DCSD Parent University, how to talk with youth about making healthy decisions. My name is Stacy. I work for the communications department for the Douglas County School District, and I'll be introducing our guests this evening. First, we have Zach Tess, DCSD Director of Health, Wellness and Prevention. Joining him is Lori Lacombe, DCSD Healthy Schools Coordinator, and together, they will lead a discussion on how to navigate tricky conversations about health with your child. And using the chat function, function, if you would, please share with us what brought you here today. What questions need you need answering? What do you hope to walk away with? And maybe you're trying to discuss screen time or substance abuse, mental health, maybe exercise, you know, whatever challenges you face, we hope that you will leave tonight with some concrete skills and resources that can help you create an environment of wellness in your family. And real quick, I just want to give a shout out to our partners at Sky Ridge Medical Center who make the DCSD Parent University program possible. Zach and Lori, I'll hand things off to you. All right, thank you, Stacy. Welcome everybody. So kind of you to come and spend this hour with us tonight. Um, my name again is Lori Lacombe and I run the Healthy Schools program here in Douglas County School District and um, real quick just so you kind of get an idea what that means is um, we do we help schools create school health improvement plans based off the whole school community child model. And um, we work in this year about 50 schools, uh, non-COVID times about around 70 schools. And um, we'll work around nutrition, movement, social emotional learning, health education, physical environment, family engagement, and so on. And so I can't tell you how happy I am to be here tonight. When Zach asked, do you wanna go talk about health at Parent University? I was like, yes, I am in 100% favorite topic to talk about. So I that's what I'm about. Um, Zach, you want to share a little about what you do here? And you, there, you do so many things, but you want to give us a little outline? Absolutely. Yeah, I think the only disappointment we had was we only had an hour to talk with all of you guys because right, <laughs> as Lori and I were planning, like, what could we talk about? We're like, man, that's like three hours of stuff. We could just talk with parents like we'd have a ball just on here. Um, yeah, so I'm a director of health, wellness, and prevention, and I do we do a lot of work with restorative practices, with uh, social emotional learning, um, trauma responsive practices, and um, helping schools uh, figure out how to organize all of that good work uh, to benefit kids. So that's that's a lot. That's kind of what I what I do, and um, and a lot of it's applicable to what we're going to talk about tonight. I take pieces and parts of all that research and what we are actually teaching our parent are teaching our teachers and the adults in the buildings um, how to interact with kids and help them feel like they belong and and connected and supported and we can bring a lot of that same stuff to to all of you um, so we hope we, you you hear some of that and you hope, we hope you get some nuggets uh, for tonight and it'll also kind of give you a good idea of what's going on in the school in the school buildings because a lot of this stuff does does um, translate for sure uh, thank you, Zach. So um, we know that we as parents, Zach and I are both parents, uh, we know this parenting is tough. Uh, we didn't get a manual, maybe you did. If you did, please share it. Um, but we know that everyone is doing some amazing work with their, with their children already. And we're, our goal tonight is to hopefully give you a couple nuggets of information um, that you can maybe use with your own children, share with friends, but also to share tonight in this venue. And so um, I see that a couple of people have used the chat, wonderful. Um, looking at what some of the topics that have been brought up, we do believe that we will be able to um, tackle some of these topics. But right now we just love to see who, um, what schools are being represented here. So if in the chat, you wouldn't mind just typing in where your children attend school. If it's more than one, just put in both or all three. At one point I had one in elementary, one in middle and one in high. So go ahead and put that in. And just also, we wanted to make this as interactive as we possibly could in this venue. Um, so if you would like to uh, raise your hand to chat, 
go ahead and please use the function at the bottom of your screen um, to participate in the discussion at any time. Um, and we'll manage that as it comes through. So looks like we've got um, people from all of our feeders here. Great, wonderful. Thunder Ridge, Challenge to Excellence, Mountain Ridge. I was, in, I was at a Mountain Ridge for like eight years. So I was an a, Dean and AP there for eight years before I got to the district, so. Mm-hmm. I have a child there. Three have gone through Mountain Ridge. All right. And my daughter's at Sagewood. And my son, I don't see any Northeast. My son's at Northeast. All right, well. Let's move on. Go, Zach, you wanna talk a little about what brought us here tonight? Yeah, you know, we know in this work and all this, all this work we're doing for our, our students and our youth in the district, uh, we know the power of parents and we know the power of positive adults in kids' lives. We, like I said, I do a lot of work in, in the trauma world um, and, um, you know, setting schools up and, and giving people the skills that to work with the children have been impacted by adverse childhood experiences. And when you start to really dig into mental health and, and trauma and substance use and a lot of those unhealthy decisions that you know, we will probably get into a little bit tonight, um, that's that the, the, one of the overwhelming themes is that are so important is that they're feeling connected and that, that they belong and that the adults in their life are so important. Our, our last Healthy Kids Colorado survey the, our, our students and our kids in schools are, are saying, you know, how important their parents are, how important it is um, that they know their parents would disapprove. Now, they might not tell you that, right? I'm, I'm sure. But they're indicating in, in surveys and when we ask them that it is important when, when a parent sets some expectations and sets some limitations and, and models some of those things. And it, it really makes a huge impact. And um, they're going to thank you, you know, like in what, 10, 15 years, they'll thank you. Um, right now, they'll just argue and fight with you. And that we, we get that developmentally, that's what's supposed to happen, right? They're, they're like starting to be their own person. And so you might get some of that pushback, but you wait, they'll thank you for all those, all those limit setting things that you do. Um, but that's, that's why we really thought we, we, we know how important you all are. And we just want to help, like, we want to share some of this knowledge and and, um, and get us talking about it and collaborating more. I mean, it's, it's really important when we talk about education, how important our parent community is um, to educating our youth. And like, if we're all on the same page and we're partnering, man, good things are gonna happen. So that's kind of, that's why Lori and I were really excited about, about um, this night tonight. So when we were talking about, well, what dimension of health do we tackle tonight? So what we thought would work for tonight is really just talk about um, some of the dimensions of health, get a little into it, and then really talk more about strategies to have conversations with your children about these different dimensions of health. And health means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, so we're going with the basics. Um, so I wanted to start really, and I could, we could really teach like it's an, an, a class on each one of these topics and we have throughout the district to students and to staff, but let's start with sleep. Sleep is an aspect of our health that is overlooked and um, it is uh, very, very important for proper brain functioning. When you sleep, you store your long-term memories, but your brain also does a natural cleaning system when you sleep. It helps rid it from toxins. And so, and you really need to have, get some of that nice deep sleep, those RPM cycles. And so just as a reminder, our younger students need about nine to 12 hours and our teenagers need about eight to 10 hours. And that might look different. Like I have three teenagers in the house right now. So their 10 hours starts a little, a little later in the night and it goes a little later in the morning and that's okay. And we also wanted to point out how important sleep is for us as parents so we can be the best parent that we can be. And we should be giving, getting at least seven hours of sleep. Another piece is food. And we, another again, another class, but just as a reminder, you know, our brains are amazing. And the prefrontal cortex part of our brain is responsible for all the executive functioning. So problem solving, decision making, working memory, socializing, focusing. 
Um, and it actually guzzles about 20% of the energy you consume in a day, uh, which is funny because the brain doesn't even weigh three pounds. So this part of it is consuming 20% of that energy, which just tells you how important it is. And, um, and so the food, we really need to make sure our kids are getting enough food, they're getting enough fruits and vegetables, they're really watching the sugar intake, because then you've got the blood sugar, you know, trying to keep that all in a, in a proper balance for brain functioning. Um, and the fruits and veggies, about two and a half cups a day. And I would lean a lot more towards veggies because when it comes to sugar, we're supposed to have about 24 grams of sugar a day. That's about six teaspoons, which if you go to your fridge in a little bit and read a yogurt, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, there's eight or 12. That's like half the sugar we're supposed to be consuming. And on top of it includes natural sugar. So like a banana has about 11 grams of sugar. So if you eat, you know, two bananas in a day, you're pretty much there. So just some kind of things to think about and also water, 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 water. Like they're like little plants, these people, right? Just feed them and water them, feed them and water them. Uh, just as kind of Zach talked about a little bit, part of the health is our the relationships that we have and our children have and the relationship we have with our children. We're gonna talk about that a lot deeper pretty soon here, but it's so important that our children feel like they have a trusted peer to go to and a trusted adult to go to. They don't need millions, they don't need thousands. Nope, but they need at least one each. To, for them to feel safe and feel like they belong and they feel loved. Physical activity, and I saw some of those come up in the chat, so um, let's tackle that for a moment. Uh, we are recommended to get about 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity a day. And so vigorous, moderate, you know, your heart rate's starting to go faster, you can feel it, you feel like you're moving. and. According to the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, our middle school and high school students are meeting that about 50% are. Um, and so, but that's a really hard uh, thing to get going. Um, I will share with you a couple uh, things that have been helpful in our household. Cause I, as I said, I have teens and I have one who loves to move and two who don't at all. And um, when COVID came around and probably this was a gift of COVID. Uh, remember a year ago when we were all literally locked inside um, we started the family mile every day. We started doing it every day, four o'clock, get off your computers. I don't care if you walk it, I don't know if you crawl it. I don't care if you sprint it and we don't even talk to you the whole time. You're going out and you're doing it. And we did it for about two and a half weeks. And then the kids were like, okay, I get it, mom, dad, we get it. Uh, we'll figure this out on our own. And now though, because we did that, we, they started getting into that habit. And so it was anything you can do, but I will tell you, it was like pulling teeth in the beginning. The other thing is getting memberships that are cool for kids at, um, the, at the high school level. Like, so for example, my kids go to Mountain Vista and Mountain Ridge. Choose Fitness is a cool place to go. And so membership for one of the kids to choose because that motivates, oh, I can meet a friend there, I'm gonna work out. Working out with friends is another fabulous motivator. Um, and then there's also docking it, so you're you know noting it and journaling it and noticing how much you're doing it, so you can actually celebrate it. Um, I can go on about physical activity, but I'll stop. Uh, the other another part dimension of health is purpose. Do our kids have purpose? What is their role? So in our house, you know, you have to have a purpose in the home. So your purpose is to be a contributing member. Like that you're, I'm not here to like do all your laundry and do all your food and you're part of this. You can put your dishes in the dishwasher and actually you can put everybody's dishes in the dishwasher because someone's going to do it tomorrow for everybody. And so really helping your student, your children ask, ask them, what's your purpose? What, what do you think it is about? Let's talk about it and help them work it out. Um, screen time, of course, is a concern especially with so much learning going on in the screen time. So um, what we would like to really talk about more is like screen time that's used as downtime and how to moderate that. And CDC is really recommending about one to two hours of that. 
And um, what I love, the American, uh, the Association of uh, Pediatrics suggests that we are media mentors for our children, where we help mentor them how to use this in a responsible way that's just not rotting our brains away. And part of that is really bringing to their attention how much time they're actually spending doing it because they don't realize it. So for months and months we were using, you know, on the phone, there's a tracker. How many hours have you been on YouTube, Instagram? Uh, all I can't even think of all the social media platforms, but, um, and really helping your kids make goals for that and really helping them achieve those goals. So holding them accountable to it. Um, so the screen time, we also want to make sure that our screen time isn't replacing other activities. And so rather than going down to play basketball, the kids sitting on the couch for a few hours, just playing, uh, you know, their game and um, really saying, hey, I, you love playing basketball. Why aren't, how about we go down together? Or how about you go out, walk the dog or whatever it is, I'll drop you off, ride the bike, whatever it is, get them motivated and excited about it. And then the last um, aspect of health that we wanted to bring up was really talking about, or really just bringing awareness to the pressures our children are experiencing in the year 2021 during the COVID times, living in a high affluent, high achieving community and how that can be a lot. And so really having a lot of conversations about that and helping them talk it out and balance it out. Um, I don't know about you, but some of my kids' friends are in like 500 activities <laughs> and I know I'm exaggerating, but literally like five activities. And so um, I learned this little uh, trick from Kristen Ray. She wrote the book, Mindful Parenting and she runs an amazing, um, the Mindful Life program up in Steamboat Springs. But um, she said, take a calendar and have your, write down all the activities your children do. And things that are super active, circle them in red. And then when you have downtime, when they actually have downtime, and this, not counting this, that's not downtime. When they actually have some downtime, circle it in blue. And then you get a, this really beautiful visual of how overworked our kids are. Because we need time to relax. We need these times. Our kids need these so badly. Like, there's this part of our brain called the default mode network. And it's part of the brain that helps us think things out and be creative. And it's so important for us to give ourselves time. That's why sometimes they're like, oh my God, I had my best idea in the shower today. Or the best idea in my walk today is because you're going into that default mode network. And so it's just so important to get, make sure our kids have some space during their day. Because if you think about it, like my kids are up at 6.30, out the door at seven, they come home at three. And then it's like, oh, they go, okay, got lacrosse, I got my job, got my homework, friends. Well, when is your downtime? So food for thought, something to think of if you like it, use it, if not, don't. So now enough about that. Would anybody in the chat, do you want to, or raising your hand, is there anyone who wanted to bring up any other dimension of health that might not have been brought up um, right now that you wanted us to touch on before we move a little more into those parenting strategies uh, when we're talking about health and those difficult conversations about health with our kids. So I'll just give you a moment to, if anyone want to type anything in there. Um, I'm just going to respond to um, Suzanne. It has it asked, where do your kids do their homework? Um, and Zach, I can go first here. Um, my kids, we our, our dining room is no longer a dining room. It turned into a school about a year ago. So we have homework space in there. But then when they need to spread out, we, we put um, desks in a couple kids' rooms. So I have three kids still at home. Um, and then we have the dining room table. And so we really spread out and we change it up, up a bit. Um, 
And so that, well, how about you, Zach? How would you, answer, what are your kids doing? I mean, there's, there's a lot of research around that, especially like so much stuff that was coming out to, I'm sure you, everybody here was inundated with things from all the experts telling us how this was going to look. And, and that's great. And I, and I, you know, I think some of what they said was, was really, was really good. And that was, you know, try to find a dedicated space um, that, that was their homework space. So it was the, this mental thing that was like, okay, when I'm in this space, I'm working. And when I'm in this space, I'm chilling out. And when I'm in this space, I'm sleeping. And that makes sense. Like I, you, I get it lo logically, um, you know, but not all of us have those. Like, I mean, I'm super lucky. Like what you're seeing behind me here was our playroom. And then my kids are like old enough now. I have a sixth grader and a third grader and we were able to make that into office space for them. And so they, each of them had a desk and it worked out just perfectly, right? Well, lucky us. And then sometimes I'll find my daughter when, when they weren't hundred percent, she'd be in her, on her bed. And I'd go in there and check and say, uh, how you doing in there? <laughs> you know, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but it was a, it was a conversation. And I just wanted to make sure that, that she was being productive and she wasn't watching TikTok videos because that's, you know, definitely caught that a couple of times. So I think it's, I think it's, it's being able to talk to your kids and, 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 and do that together and work together on what is a good space for them to do their homework and work and what makes sense, makes sense for your family. And, I think, I just don't think you can lose when you actually are, when you have that conversation and we're going to go through some, how to, you know, how to do that because those can be tricky, right? We, we can all fall into lecture mode. Like, you know, Lori and I were teachers and we can lecture really well. She was probably way better than I was, but I could, I was an eighth grade science teacher. And let me tell you, I could lecture. Um, and, and, you know, it, that's really not super effective <laughs> with your own children as my well, daughter tells me. And my daughter will tell me and she rolls her eyes and says, yeah, but so I, you know, engage in that conversation, but there, I think there is some good research around having, trying to create some dedicated space and then having a conversation about that. So. I think that was really good advice, Zach, and just making them part of that conversation. Yeah. That's the key. Um, just to answer Teresa's question about sugar, um, Teresa, I, um, I, for the month of January, gave up sugar completely and it was a really interesting learning experience and my high school student I talked her into doing it with me and I read the book I quit sugar and I highly recommend that and I read it with her and I shared these facts with my kids and we learn more and more about what sugar can what do, what it does do to the blood sugar levels and the brain functioning and sleep and so that seemed to help quite a bit um, and then we uh we have the Eggleston family asking about encouraging physical activity to more resistant. It's always a tough thing. I'm really trying to dive deep in to what would possibly, there's some exercise for everybody, right? Like you can do yoga floating from the ceiling now. You can fence, you can play, what is that game? Cornhole, you know, it was like on TV the other day a competitive cornhole game. So really diving, what is something they like and just starting there just starting there, doing it as a family, making it really fun. Um, again, trying to get the friends involved and just supporting body image. I mean, that's a whole nother discussion too. Um, and that's a great thing to reach out um, to some counselors at schools about. They've got some great information about how to work with body images. Um, we're gonna go, we've got a question about how do you teach a teenager to make good decisions? And that's, we have some tips. So. Yeah. Let's we, go wanna, there. we wanna give you the tips, we, we do. And, and these are like guidelines because every kiddo is different. Everyone, every kiddo has their unique needs um, and, um, and challenges. So we wanna give you some, some tips. And um, I wish we had magic pixie dust that, that we could hand out to everybody that they just do what you say, but that's not the reality. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and here's the other thing, as far as all of us as parents, just please have grace and patience with yourself. And I'm not just saying, I'm not trying to joke around. I mean, I'm, I'm being very, very serious because this is very difficult. Any, you, you all are here, you're all parents. We, and parenting is very hard. Um, and some days we do a great job and some days we are not so good at it. And I have had way I've plenty of times that I, I would love people to observe and go, man, this guy teaches this stuff. Like, <laughs> really? Like, <laughs> <laughs> take a page out of your own book, buddy. Um, but so, so that, that is going to be, that, that's a key thing. Um, you know, I think a, another key thing as we get into the tips is, is you being ready 
to talk to your teen about these things and having um, possibly a difficult conversation, a resistant conversation. And we know in the social emotional learning world, when we're talking to our teachers about this, our first step is that the teachers are taking care of themselves so that the teachers are regulated. They, they have mastered this social emotional learning so that they can, you know, impart that wisdom and model those same things to their students. And that's what, that's what Lori and I want to ask of you also. So make sure all these, those health things that Lori just went on, that applies to us as adults. And one of the big reasons is that, that modeling piece, but it is because we need to be healthy in here, in here, and we need to be ready for these conversations. Um, Cause I'll tell you, my 12 year old little girl has pushed the buttons, right? And if I'm not regulated, right? If I'm not ready to have this conversation, then I get dysregulated. Um, many of you like me might be an empath, right? I, my, I, I tell them, I tell everybody, my, my daughter has emotional superpowers and she got those from me. So when we're happy, we're really happy. But when we're losing it, we're losing it. And nothing's getting done really well at that point. So um, being prepared for the conversation and going into it with a little bit of a plan. So hopefully these tips, right, can help you kind of prepare yourself like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this, this, I'm going to use some of these tips and I'm going to be ready for resistance. I'm going to be ready for the great stuff too, but I'm going to be ready. And I'm regulated. Like I'm not doing this emotionally. Um, we did, uh, Nate Thompson, if any of you talk, saw his presentation, I loved it because he talked about naming his amygdala, right? The part of your, your emotional center, of your brain and talking your amygdala down, right? Like, so my son and I've done this. And my amygdala's name is Rocky, right? My, my stress response is fight. So I get loud. I get like, yeah, that's me, right? So I have to talk to Rocky and say, yo, Rocky, settle down, dude. Like, it's not that big of a deal right now. It's not an emergency. Everybody's fine. No one's dying. I think we're going to be okay. So let's calm it down. Let's take some breath. Let's get ourselves ready. And let's, let's actually converse right? So uh, that is, and, and that's important. Um, there's a lot of science around mirror neurons. And I can tell you, I, I've witnessed this a million times. I could, I mean, hopefully you learn from my mistakes and I'm, I don't mind being vulnerable and just telling you how many times I've messed up because it's, it's all about learning, right? And my daughter comes into the house dysregulated about school or track practice or gymnastics. And those mirror, neuron, mirror neurons, I mean, we're, re, you know, she's my daughter. She, I love her to death. And when she is upset, I am me, I feel that same thing. I really feel what she's feeling. And we can easily mirror that because that's what our body does. It's it's a it's a natural thing. And so again, recognizing that, talking to my amygdala and saying, whew, your daughter is all dysregulated. Do you really need to be? Because she looks safe. There's not blood coming out, out of her right now. And you know, all her limbs are attached. So all right, like I can, I can, I can disconnect. I can go back up to my frontal lobe, and I can start having a conversation and stay regulated. Um, and and that modeling also in a stressful situation. And we're going to talk about modeling again because we've talked about it, right? Parents are really important, and and our kids really value. You, they may not say it again, but they really value and look and watch what you're doing. And if we can stay regulated in a stressful situation, it matters. And so. Um, and the kids need to see that. The kids need to see the parent as the authority figure. They need to see them managing this stress in this crazy time and, and doing the best they can. Okay. And then when you mess up, like I do all the time, I apologize and I own it. It's, it, that's, that, it's a difference maker. Hey, I shouldn't have yelled at you. I was really upset too. I saw you upset. I got upset. Dad didn't handle that the right way. Okay. And then we can move on. So that's all part very quickly, but that's all kind of getting yourself ready to engage in these, in these conversations. All right, Lori. And I think what, um, just to kind of add on to that a little, Zach, I think um, creating your, Jen had asked in the, in the chat, like, well, do we have a, like a list for these conversations? And I think the best thing to do is, um, is that you're in the situation you're noticing maybe for example your child's eating junk food all the time right and you want to talk to them about it is really taking that step back to so you are cre able to create a thoughtful response with your child and be like okay i want to talk about these things with you um i think that alone can really help the situation like i've done that with my kids like i'll watch them for a few days i'm like oh i see this pattern and then i'm like 
okay, how can I deal with this? And just what Zach was saying, I got to make sure I come in calm. I got to come in non-judgmental and I got to be just ready to kind of listen and talk through it with them. So, which really brings us to the next point, which is listening which is listening. Um, Epictetus said, you have two ears and one mouth, so you can listen twice as much as you can speak. Just think about it for just a sec, like how much are we listening? How much are we listening? About, I don't know, it was probably about eight, nine years ago, I had this switch flip in my brain where I realized I'm listening to my students all day and I come home and I don't listen to my own children. And I had to switch it and I had to be like, no, I'm going to be mindfully here with them all the time. That is my goal. <laughs> That's my goal. I try. I, I don't always make it, but how can we be really effective listeners with our kids? Will you just listen to them? And sometimes you just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to respond. I'm just like, oh, okay. Thank you for sharing that. Or how did that make you feel? Or what do you think about that? What do you think about that? Like, so for example, one of my one of my kids, he's been taking naps after school. And guess what? He's waking up in the morning and he's like, I didn't really sleep that well. <laughs> well, hmm, okay, so let's think about this. And so I just kept watching it and I kept watching it. And I'm like, so how is this making you feel taking these naps? And how is it correlating with your sleep? And he just talk, 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 talk until all of a sudden he's like, you know what? I probably just shouldn't be napping after okay, well, why don't you give it a try and see if that works? And if that doesn't work, let's do something else. But a lot of times our, our children just need the question asked and then first just to sit back and listen. There's this other acronym I love, it's WAIT. If you ever notice, you become one of those peanuts parents where you're like, wah, 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 wah. you know, that's what your kids are hearing at that point. I, and I see the look in their eye. They get this, I call it the gall look, that glazed over look. And they're like, and I have to stop and ask myself, why am I talking? Why am I talking? How about I just take a little step back and just listen? And it can be one of the hardest things. I will tell you one of the best places to listen to your children is in the car, because it's just you guys. Put the phone down, tell me how your day was, who'd you eat lunch with, what's going on, what were your highlights, what were the tough things, and just kind of work through it. Um, and just keep and also role model that for them with with your uh, you know partner in crime and uh, with each other and commend them when you do see really good listening happening. So Zach, you want to go into role modeling? Yeah. And and um and so I'm answering. Oh darn! I guess Stacy, I did mean for those to go to everybody. I did answer some things in the chat, everybody. I'm sorry. And they only went to the panelists. So I'm very sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think I can copy and paste these. Do you want me to do it, Zach? And you can chat about what well, uh, Yeah, could you please? Thank you. Yep. Um, and, and to answer your your <laughs> Scott, um, because I, I answered in the chat. Um, yes, absolutely. It's never too late. Um, our the research is very, very, very clear about that. And even um with students impacted significantly. Um, with with adverse childhood experience, I mean, experienced significant uh, PTSD uh, uh, from some serious situations. That it's it isn't too late. I mean, the brains of our, our youth are developing until their early twenties, and even after that, like there there are ways to 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 work through that. Um, I can tell you personal experience. Um, I experienced four adverse childhood experiences as I grew up, and my sister probably more. Um, and you know. She, I think she started her therapies in her in her 30s. So it's not, it's never too late. And with our kids, it rolls right into this next part is that it is the role modeling. And and it's about again, it's role modeling like, hey, you know what? I learned something new, or I wanna I realize what's been going on and let's work together to fix this. And I know. Um, that I haven't maybe in your situation, I, I don't handle stress really well. It's it's really hard for me. I get really concerned. I get really worried. My amygdala, Rocky up here, it, 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 it's, it fires really, you know, a lot. And and it, it takes over in these stressful situations. And, and you know, that's something that dad's going to work on. And this is what I, I have this conversation with my my kids, especially my son, who, because I, I want to role model, you know, how to handle stress and not be so like physical and angry with it, but to just sit there and talk to him and say, hey, what you saw there, dad punching the wall, 
that's not an effective strategy. Okay. Dad's still working on his stuff and I didn't have anyone to help me out, but let's work together because I don't want you to go down that same road. Right? I want you to have better strategy. So let's think about when you start feeling dysregulated and angry, what's going on? What could we do? What could dad do to help you? And so, um, never too late. And, and Scott, I don't handle stress really well, but I've been working at it. I'm, I'm telling you probably in the last 20 years, it, it, you know, um, I've really put in some work and, and Lori's been a lot of help in that and her work around mindfulness and getting us all involved in that and meditation and a lot of other ways to help myself get better at that. I mean, I, I grew up pretty tough and was in the military and I like, there's certain ways you handle stress, right? And they aren't always positive. And, you know, then you get married and have kids and you're like, whoa, like you, you need to adjust and you need to fix this. And it's, and it's growth. We work on ourselves all the time. And, you know, what better role modeling is there, uh, you know, like, and vulnerability and say, it's okay. Like we don't handle these things always the best. And, um, and I realize that, and I'm going to do the work and then we're going to work together. So don't ever feel defeated. Um, again, grace and patience, like, got to have grace with yourself, man. Like if we don't, I don't know. So um, the role modeling piece, just to go into a little bit more about that, you know, it, it, I, like I said, I have that tendency to lecture, right? And so we want to make sure that our timing is, is, is good with, with these conversations with, with our kiddos. And when we bring up these things, we, we want to try not to lecture. And even though it's in, I mean, our parents lecture to us, our teachers lecture to us. If you're, if you're about my age, that's what we did, right? We sat there, we took notes and we got lectured to and, and, and then we like shut off. And that's what'll happen with our, or with our kids. They really will. And they, you know, they, it is like, um, Charlie Brown and pretty soon is rah, 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 that's what they're hearing. So try to keep them short, not like what I'm doing right now, um, the opposite and uh, keep, it <laughs> keep it short and sweet. Um, and, and when you're, when you're asking questions, try to do some really good, um, some really good open-ended questions, questions that don't just have a yes or no. Like, are you going to drink at the party tonight? No. <laughs> Right. But, but it could be something like, wow, you, there's a party tonight, huh? Like, do you think there might be alcohol there? And it's, you know, we're having a conversation. Like, what if you, what do you think about alcohol? Like, what do you think about that? Again, I'm not jumping to the conclusion that my, that you're bad and my kid's going to make a bad choice and that, you know, all things are bad. Right. I'm not, I'm not jumping there. I mean, I might think that back in here, but I'm not going to, I'm not going there with my kiddo. And so it, it, we're going to ask open and we're going to, then we can start a conversation and I can get what they're saying and I can hear them and listen to them. Um, and you know, that, that has to come across as authentic too. It can't be like, I know we said pre be prepared, um, with the conversation, but don't read a script either that won't come across like very authentically it needs to be who you are what you know and how you and have how you talk to your kids and just thinking about some of these tips as, as you do it and Zach can I just add one more thing um, to really what Scott was asking about is that our brains have this ability to change all the time. It's called neuroplasticity and we can constantly create these new neural pathways. So Zach used to have this pathway that went right to his amygdala and would just be like, boom, that I react, I react, I react. But what he has done is he spent a lot of time and effort um, working on creating that neural pathway that dodges the amygdala or uses amygdala to his benefit. And so this neuroplasticity, we can constantly grow our minds. We can do this until we're 100, which is amazing, or 110, yeah. however old you're going to live to, which and I think is very cool, brain science. Very cool. And so to repeat Scott's question, because it did just go to the panelists. So if you guys have questions for everybody, the mistake I made is I didn't change it to everyone. I had just the panelists, but Scott's was... Um, you know, if, if, if you don't handle stress well, and, um, you know, your, your kids are older and they, you know, you, they've seen that is, is there still time to change? Is there still time to, you know, correct some of that stuff? And that's, that's what we were talking about. And like, absolutely. There's always time. So, yep. So, um, moving to our next strategy, talking about difficult conversations with your kids about how around health and wellness, is just to be reasonable. It's just to have, just to remind uh, um, all of us that we're constantly changing and growing our children's brains. They don't develop until 
25 to 30. And actually the, it's, the research is looking, it might even take a little longer. And the brains, the way they develop is they start at the back, they grow the fastest there. And then they continue to fully develop in the front, the front, the prefrontal cortex where we started this conversation is actually the last to develop. So we do have to be super reasonable that they're growing and learning and changing and mistakes are really good. Our, we need our students, our kids to make, make mistakes, but we have to be there to help them process them. Not to judge them, to help process them, right? And so, um, and also just really looking at, when I look at health of my children and myself, I really look at like, what was the week like? Because if I determine my health and what I did yesterday after lunch, probably like be like, I'm a really unhealthy person the way I tackled my chocolate collection. I mean, it was like a little out of control. Um, and so, but if I look at the whole week, wait, I didn't have sugar on Sunday. I didn't have sugar on Monday. Okay, Tuesday, I had a little, a little more than I wanted to, but today's Wednesday, I'm doing great. I haven't had any yet today. And so just to, so you can look really at the whole week. I mean, really also when it comes to our kids' health, like we can only control what we can control. You know, there's like spheres of control. We can control what we put in our kids' lunches, but then we can influence the rest. We can't control what they're gonna eat at school. We don't know who they're sitting next to and what they're trading. And when you get teenagers who can drive, ay, 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 I'm gonna just say that a million times <laughs> because I've got that situation going on. Um, but then really kind of looking at like, well, what does the whole week look like and what can I control when they're around me? So uh, most days I'll make a big platter of just cut up fruits and veggies and I just put it on the counter. I'm just gonna see what happens. Six out of seven days, that thing is gone, you know? And just like these little things where you can like, oh, I can get a little plug in there. Or, hey, we're all gonna go walk. We're all, you know, just these little things that you can, you can control. Um, and just be as positive as possible, you know? Being positive is very impactful. There's a lot of really great research about positivity and optimism. And so let's talk a little about setting expectations. Yeah, so there's a lot of work we, I teach in the district is around restorative practices. And, and you may have heard that and you may have heard the misperceptions around it. And, but uh, it is around really building positive community and relationships. And then when people make mistakes, it's about, holding them accountable, right, to the community, to those people that they've harmed, um, which has a lot of power. Part of that learning, part of that philosophy um, is what we call operating in the with box and doing things with. So there's this thing called the social discipline window. And it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a, 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 it's a graph, right? And, but it, it has different quadrants. And the, and the quadrant, um, you know, that we want to operate in, the, if we want to, not that we always do, but we want to operate in that with column, meaning we set really high expectations, right? Our, we know that our youth need expectations. They need limits. I mean, they might fight it and argue it, but, but when we do more research where we really see youth struggling is when there aren't limitations and there aren't some of those expectations set and no limits set for them. Right. And so we they need that. OK. And so we want to we want to have high expectations like, hey, you're going to eat healthy or you're going to get your homework done or you're going to have this much physical activity. OK. And then the other axis on, on this graph for this these quadrants is around that um, that, that continuum of like support and nurturing. Um, and we want to be on the high end of that. So. Yes, we want to set high expectations, but we also want to support them and give them the skills and be there and um, and be ready to help them attain that. Right there, there's you know nothing worse than like saying you will do that and then good luck, right? And I hope I hope you make it. Um, and so, it, I think it's it's just something to keep in mind that that it's good to set some of those, right? And and in that with box, right? So when you're there and it's part of that being reasonable too, what Lori was just talking about is that they help create that. So part of that philosophy, and there's a quote by the guy who developed it, it said though people, human beings, and so children are more likely to kind of buy in and do the things that people of authority um, want them to do 
if they if it's done with them as opposed to to them or for them right and i think we can all have those experiences where things have been done to us it's we don't like it right and i don't like it or for us and like i know i mean like for like not like i i could got you some chicken noodle soup because you were sick for you i mean you did it for me because you didn't trust that i could do it right um there was no empowerment there and and it was a kind of devalued like you aren't good enough to do it so i'm going to make that decision or I know you can't make this decision on your own teenager, so I'll make it for you type of thing, right? So in, in, that, in that with box, in that with box, we're, we're having that conversation together. And that means authentically, again, like I said before, being authentic, engaging them in this conversation, right? Explaining how, why you got there and then setting those clear expectations. Um, and, and those are, I think, three really good, just super kind of broad things to think about. But if I'm really authentically engaging with my kids in a discussion around their healthy choices, around going to a party, around marijuana use, around alcohol, around <laughs> relationships, some of you are having those conversations, right? Like engage with them, you know, and, and truly see what they actually know. Don't misperceive level of risk. There's, a, there's studies out there um, that show that we as adults, um, that we misrepresent or we misconstrue um, our, young, our youth's perception of risk. They actually perceive things like either it's good or you'll die, right? They don't see a lot of in between, which we as adults know, like, I mean, you could die, but there's all these other things that could happen too, right? And so, so when we start in a conversation around alcohol, or relationship, relationships, and we say, you're going to do this. And if you do it, you'll die. They, it's like, yeah, I know that. Like we, we could have had a conversation, but now you just jump to that. And now I don't feel like we're, I'm included in this conversation and that you didn't understand where I, that I already knew some of this stuff. So that's that in authentic engagement. Ask those open-ended questions, get some understanding, some shared understanding, and, and you know, work with them to, to come up with some, some, some strategies because they want you to do that. They, they really do. And it doesn't seem like it, but they really, really do. Hey, Zach, in the chat, um, Lisa has asked, do you have some strategies um, you, that kids can use to resist peer pressure and say no? And I bet you have a great place for them to go. I, I just know with my own kids, when they started becoming teens, we would practice saying no, like, what is it? What would you actually say to your, your peer if they were doing them? Like we, I made them like actually practice saying it a couple of times, because that's like a health education strategy. And hopefully, you know, your kids are getting health education in seventh, eighth grade, but it's really great to do it at home. And also to have that, like that word, that if you're in an uncomfortable situation, you can text me with like, hey, is, is Coco okay? And then I know I have to help get you no. out of that situation. Coco's dying, get home now. You, you need to come home now. Oh my gosh. You know? So yeah. Zach, do you have a, like a place somewhere people can go for that? I will look through my stuff because it's not coming to the top of my head right now, like a exact resource. But one that, I mean, shifttheinfluence.org and we're gonna share some resources with you. The mm -hmm. shifttheinfluence.org um, has some really good scenarios to work through. Like it, it, it's like a kind of a video game for parents of, of like choose your own adventure, right? With your daughter who's going to a party um, and, and some other situations. So, and they offer some, some good ideas. And, and one of those that I like and that I've used is asking that, that open-ended question, but asking it as if they were the one giving the advice. So, um, I had a situation kind of with my daughter that felt like there might have been some like just I don't know necessarily bullying, but you know, some friends of hers maybe not being nice and, and making that poor decision of, of how they treated people. And I was like, so like what would you do if you know what would you do if if someone offered you this or did this? Um, how would you offer advice? And it was really, really cool to talk to her about what she thought the strategy would be and how would you say how would you help a friend like avoid that situation um mm -hmm. you know, at a party like what what do you think would work um and again there i am like i'm i don't have to be the expert in this because when we empower our kids and let them understand that we really do have a lot of faith in them we really do think they're pretty cool and that they can do this it's an amazing thing and i and i can tell you i was a middle school guy so i was a middle school dean and assistant principal and 
what, you know, when I involved the students in that reparation and that repair, like they, they did some harm, they made a poor choice, they brought alcohol to school, or they, they were bullying somebody, or they were in a fight. And when I just kind of was like, wow, I mean, how do you think you're going to make this right? Like, what are you going to do? Like, how are we going to figure this out? It, it is so amazing what they know and, and, and what they already know and how to do this. So I, that, that would be mine is, is trying to ask those questions. And then, is, then you can say, oh, that's pretty good. If you thought about this, you know, maybe, maybe this is something you could try too. Um, Cause the refusal skills, they are hard and, and, and having realistic expectations. Like I think all of us would love if our kid would just stand there and said, I will not have that alcohol. That is unhealthy. And I know it's bad. Right. But you know, so helping them strategize like some, maybe some different situations. And, and I guarantee you, they'll come up with them like, well, well, maybe I could just hold one dad, like, and not drink it. Sure. And, but you know, I to understand, like if the sheriff comes and knocks on the door and you're holding it, I mean, we're going to have to have a conversation. So, but not a bad strategy, dude. As long, I mean, I'm glad you're not drinking it. Right. I mean, there's, we can have, but we can have some, some more authentic conversations, I think with, with them, if we involve them in it. Awesome. Well, and I think just to, and we, again, Stacy's going to send um, our strategies out to everyone who signed up to come to this webinar tonight. But again, just to review it really purposely, like prep and be ready for the conversations, go in calm, go in ready to respond, not react. Listen, 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 listen. Um, role model the best you can. And again, Zach said, give yourself grace. We're not perfect. We're doing the best we can, but just do your best to role model. Um, be reasonable, knowing we're all growing and changing, and then setting the clear expectations. Um, so we did, Zach, I'm looking at the clock. I'm thinking maybe we should skip the scenarios and we'll kind of just let you know some of the resources you have um, here in the district. And then if there are more questions, we'd love to really be here for you to answer those. But um, a couple things, healthy schools on the district website, we have a ton of physical activity, mindfulness, um, health education, social emotional learning resources. Um, we actually have special pages just for parents. So um, please go to that website. And if you don't see what you want, let us know and we'll add it because that's what we've been doing all year. We've been, we've been listening to parents and they're saying we need physical activity breaks for our kids because they're learning from home. So we made a whole web page for just that purpose. So let us know what you need. And Lori, if, you, know, just to, yeah. you just jogged this and I don't know why I didn't think about this before when we were talking, but when, when we were really trying to plan and get people ready to go back to school um, and, and, that, and that virtual learning environment, we created in the road to return. So if you go to our website, road to return and go to parents and parent resources, like everything that Lori just said, there's links to that. And there's a link, there's so many links to having a conversation with your, with your child, social emotional learning tips with your child that you can do at home. I mean, there's just, there's like probably too many that it'd be a little overwhelming, but there's a lot of stuff to go through in there. Um, and so if, if you have time to peruse that, I, I would suggest it because it's, it's kind of at least in one kind of spot. Great idea, Zach. Maybe we could put a direct link in the sheet we're going to send out. Um, if you have students in high school, there are three classes that might be available for your children to take that you might want to nudge them to take. Healthy Decisions is one, and it counts as a PE credit, and my kids have taken it, and it is un believable. It, it is stress and sleep and saying no. And it's, it's a great course. Um, and then they also have some of our high schools have healthy relationships. And then also, if you have a student around self-regulation and you want to help them learn more about that, we have this um, either it's called introduction to mindfulness or the science of mindfulness um, that you can sign up for. I know Vista's got that, um, those three courses available. And so does uh, Rock Canyon, Castleview's got a couple of them. Um, and then the last thing that we as a district do, we do 10 Meaningful Minutes, which is a podcast that I have been doing with uh, my, our wonderful Erin Regan, who's the lead counselor here in Douglas County. And we try and focus on different topics um, 
that are meaningful for parents and working with students or their children during these times. And then in our resource list as well, we um, just put some of our favorite books out there uh, around parenting that we have found useful and the research they provide is unbelievable. We've also included our email addresses. So if there's something that you need, uh, we are here. If you want to know, learn more about what your school is doing, though, we would highly suggest reach out to the school. Um, but if you need something from us, we are here for you and we are we would love to hear from you. So there, there's a question and I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, <laughs> that that is a very that's a tough question around um, like parenting and and managing the the relationships in the home. Um, between different approaches, maybe to discipline or modeling behaviors, uh, when when maybe one models well and the other one doesn't, um, and that is a that's a that's a touchy one. Um, you know, I what some parent trainings that we've done and talks around restorative. Lee parenting, right? And we, we've done these where where we actually use some of those strategies of doing that with our with the spouse too. And when we're talking about our kids' behaviors at home um, and talking about family dynamics and talking about those kind of things, um, employing some of those same strategies of being in that with box I talked about. Because again, if we feel like we're doing it together, more likely that we're going to kind of buy into it. So um, it, it might be helpful. I'm not a I'm not a marriage counselor. Um, sometimes I play one on TV, um, but I'm really I'm not, and and so I don't want to I don't want to go too deep into that. And and maybe there's some other resources out there um, that that could be helpful. But in 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 our work that parents have seemed to to like was just some of that, and just asking open ended questions with each other, um, and and talking about what what those are as far as the role modeling and let's say because there's there's a lot of other factors like let's just take maybe substance use maybe alcohol consumption right and that's a that's a touchy one and um and alcohol consumption in our society is a is almost a norm and there's definitely different levels and so if maybe that's something right and modeling is important right our kids our kids do see what we do Right, so binge drinking for an adult male is five drinks or more uh, at a at a you know time, and for females is is considered I think four, and so that is dangerous for a lot of reasons. Now some people would be like five, man, I can that doesn't even affect me, right? But it it does as far as when you're talking about the role modeling piece and and what kids see as what's acceptable for engaging with substances, and maybe that's the maybe that's the thing. Like I don't drink a lot, but my wife. Oh, she likes the wine, right? And so, how do we? How do I engage her in a conversation? Um, and I would say it would be very similar to what I would do with my my kid. And I would see what does she know about that? What, like, do you understand? Like, what do you know about um, you know youth and alcohol consumption and and modeling behavior and um, and the importance of adult connections and what we see and you know there's always this thing, you know, there's always maybe another layer to that. And I want to be very cognizant of that, that um, there's always the issues of substance use disorder. And that's a real thing. This is not a, 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 a flaw in moral character, right? And substance use disorder is a brain disease. And we could spend another couple hours talking about, about all that. And so if that, if you suspect that, then maybe there's a conversation about getting some help around using a, use of substances. If, if that is, or anger management, or whatever, whatever it is, there, there are amazing experts out there to, to, to help folks through that, because, it, it, because just having a conversation of it might not help. But if we're not at that, let's say we're not at that level yet, and it's just being able to have an authentic conversation with our spouse and talk about um, the importance of modeling and, and behaviors, um, and see what they have to say. And, and again, I would keep it short. I mean, you know, I, my wife doesn't like if I lecture and I don't like when she lectures, right? So, you know, we're both adults and we don't appreciate that, but we do appreciate getting in some shorter conversations and, um, and, and a lot of listening and then maybe together setting some, some clearer expectations like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to help you out. If you, you know, at the drop of a hat, you get super angry and start screaming and yelling. Maybe you need to go take a break and I'll handle this one or something like that. I mean, you, it's working together. Um, but it, 
it, that's a really hard one. And I, I wish, again, I wish I had all the answers, but um, you know, I, some of these strategies could work. They work with kids. They also work with adults and then seek help. Please don't, don't, don't forget that, that there's always help out there to help you work through these things. There's, there are experts, there are great therapists that really help out in there in the community. We just wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight. If we didn't answer your question, we're sorry. Just do know you'll get our emails and we can help answer it. Um, our goal is to help, help you parent your children any way we possibly can and just to empower our kids to make really good decisions. So I think that it, our time is up. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, although, as you said, Zach, we could go on for hours and hours about all of this. Um, we won't, though. You guys will get, your e will get your evenings back, I promise. But thank you, Zach and Lori, for joining us. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And um, tomorrow, everyone here will receive a recording of this webinar, um, a link to the resources that Zach and Lori mentioned, and a link to a quick feedback survey. And we'd love to get your feedback on this experience so that we continue, so that we can continue to improve the program. Um, you can access that at the Bitly Healthy Decisions Feedback if you feel like going there now. You can also scan that QR code. Do you want to do a quick little feedback for us? And I also invite you to join us for our next webinar on April 15th, where Dr. Monica Upal, um, a psychiatry resident physician at the Medical Center of Aurora Behavioral Health and Wellness, that's, wow, that's a lot, um, will speak on how parents can play a role in preventing bullying behavior. So that information and registration link is up right now at dcsdk12.org slash parent university. We also have a webinar in the works on May 6th, in which a dietitian and a physical therapist from Skybridge Medical Center will talk about nutrition and fitness in youth. You might find that really interesting, so keep an eye out for additional information. Thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you again next time.